everybody. Uh, I'm Gemma Annabel. You can find me on Twitter at LSF. Um, and this has been Building for Utopia. Thanks for coming. Welcome to Italy if you're not from here, like me. Um, so I write software for a living. I'm not, I don't write books. I don't like do consulting. I'm not like an interesting PHP person. I just pretty much write a lot of PHP. I started at Cornell in uh, New York State. Then I switched to the postal mailing industry for several years. That was, that was great, working with the government. Yes! Um, then went to a health research uh, firm. More working with the government. It was excellent. And now I work for a Canadian startup called Wonder Proxy. If you're interested in uh, localization testing, see me at some point. I can talk to you. But that's me. Um, a year ago, my husband, who's here, um, got a job in Norway. So I'm an, I'm an American. I'm born and raised in upstate New York. He got a job in Norway, and we were like, OK, I'm a software engineer. I can work from anywhere. Let's go to Norway. And here's what that looks like. Um, so I used to live in New Mexico in the States, which is southwestern United States. It's cowboy country. And now we live in essentially a, a very cold rainforest. So it's, it's really uh, very new. Every, everything about it is new. Um, the language is new. I don't speak Norwegian. I don't speak it. This is a great joke. If, you're, if, you're, if you speak three languages, you're trilingual. And if you speak two languages, you're bilingual. What are you if you speak one language? American. Um, that's me. I, I don't speak the language. Um, we don't have a car anymore. It's, it's very expensive to own a car in Norway, and there's great public transportation, so we're taking the train everywhere. This is, this is all just very new. The daylight hours are bizarre. The, the latitude of, of Norway is roughly the same as Anchorage, Alaska. So it starts getting um, bright in the morning at around 3.30, 4, and it's not noticeably dark until like 11, 11.30. Like, it's, that's, that's crazy. We also have a new stove. It's, it's great. It's an electric stove. Um, everything in Norway is electric, not gas. So, you know, that was sad for me, but that's, that's all right. Um, so keep, keep the stove in mind, but I'll, I'll keep the picture up there so you'll remember. When we first moved, we had to go register for lots of government things. We had to, you know, deal with residence permits and taxes and employment and all this stuff. So we were taking all these trips back and forth from, from our house to um, the government offices. And every time we went, they would load us up with welcome to Norway brochures. Um, so we had like a stack of them, like just every time we went, here, have some more, please. And one of them, my husband and I laughed about hysterically because they had an entire brochure on turning, the importance of turning off the stove. They had a whole brochure on this. And we were like, is there some sort of problem with the electrical grid? Like, it, it, was, it was all about turning off the stove at night, specifically at night. So we thought maybe there's like weird fluctuations. Like, I don't, I don't know, it's a foreign country. Maybe, maybe they have weird power grid problems. I don't know. It turns out, that in Norway, the vast majority of stove fires happen at night because people come home from a night out, possibly not completely sober, make themselves a snack and go to bed, leave the stove on, burn their houses down. This is, this is enough of a problem that there is a government flyer in Norway reminding you to turn off your stove. We thought it was hysterical. We thought it was hysterical. We laughed. Who could possibly be so careless? How could so many people be this careless? All right. So we'd been in Norway about a month when my husband took off. He went on you know, some Spanish adventure doing something or other. I don't know. I was stuck in Norway where it was cold and rainy, and he was like on the coast of Spain. I'm not bitter. It's fine. Um, so I have, I have two dogs, and I was home with my dogs um, for like three weeks by myself when we had just moved. And I lasted about a week before I left the stove on overnight. Um, I was probably, I don't even remember, I was like playing video games or something late at night and I decided I was hungry, made myself some eggs and went to bed and left the stove on. Fortunately, I removed the pan from the warm stove. I don't know how I got that far and didn't turn off the stove, but whatever. The house didn't burn down, but the next morning I went to the kitchen. It was like 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's freedom units, um, in the kitchen. It was, it was just like a thick layer of condensation on every glass surface. It was scary. It was scary. I walked into the kitchen and it was, it was, it was scary. So I, I was careless. I was, I was careless. Um, 
I don't like to think of myself as, as dumb. I'm kind of the, the classic, like, child is identified as gifted early, and then being smart becomes a part of their identity, and then they're terrified to fail or be wrong ever. That's me. So I don't like to think of myself as stupid. Um, I, I'm a functioning adult. You know, I feel like I'm... I can't be completely, completely losing it. But I was careless. I did not exercise the proper level of care for using this stove. So let's look at the level of care that you need to operate this stove. Okay. So these are the controls on the on the. Do you see the controls on the bottom here? I mean, it's a stove. You guys have seen the stove before. So uh, clockwise from the bottom left. So front left, back left, back right, front right. And these are oven. And there's two lights here. Um, there's oh, there's like. Where is it? There's like little squiggly lines. I don't know if you can see them. To this day, I don't know what the squiggly lines mean, but there they are. So here it is from the top. This is top-down view of my stove in my house. Just from this, what, which burner is on right now? Anybody? Which burner is warm? This tells you nothing about the current state of the stove. The, the, the actual, like, the the interface, what you're actually using to heat stuff up, doesn't tell you anything about the thing you're using to heat stuff up. But this isn't really fair. You need the controls, right? So here's a top-down view. But this is what it looks like when I'm using it, of the controls at the bottom there. Who saw that a burner was on? Who saw which burner it was? This burner is not actually on right here. That, that's off. The broiler's on. And that's why this light is red, because the broiler's on there. That's kind of not fair, because I, like, I did like halfway, so it looks like it's on. Let's do another one. Controls at the bottom here. Red light's on. Who saw the oven was on? <laughs> you know I'm trying to trick you. So the oven's not actually on. It, it's got like temperature, but this is off. Uh, where is it? This is on, right here. Back right burner. This, this stove is built for utopia. This stove is built for people who are never rushing, who are never careless, who always take time when they're using a stove. They always double check, triple check the controls to make sure that the correct burner is on or off, the oven is on or off. This is, this is a stove for people who never make mistakes with, with what they're looking at, who never see the wrong thing or misinterpret. Um, it's for perfect people. That's, that's who this stove is for. Stove tops aren't the only everyday object uh, that were sort of built for utopian people. Doors are some of my favorite, and my friends and family will tell you that, like, whenever I see a door like this, I just ha there's like a wave of rage that goes over me. So the controls here, these are the controls for the door. They're door handles, right? You guys have seen doors before. They're exactly the same in both cases. You need the signs to tell you what to do with the door because the controls lie to you. It's just, it's just mind blowing. It's just, you have to read the sign. So, okay. These are the stovetop and the door. These are classic examples of what I call user interface bugs. Um, user interfaces that lie to the user or mislead the user or don't give the user enough information to use the interface. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're all user interface problems, th these two. And if you want to read more about that, there's this great book called The Design of Everyday Things. Has anybody read that? It was 1988, but it's classic. It's been updated. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, fantastic book on the topic. Um, but user interfaces, uh, or the tendency to build for utopia doesn't exist only in physical objects like stoves and doors. Um, and it's not always a user interface bug. Any time we have a system or a process that involves human beings, we're going to try to build for utopia because we want, we want to think about the best case. Um, and we need to not because 
every process and every system involves human beings at some level. Um, and none of us are perfect. So, is anybody here a really hardcore fan of like command line Git? Yeah, a couple of people, a couple of people. Okay, I love command line Git. I think it's great. I, it's infamously bad and hard to use. Um, and I, you will get no argument from me on that. But there's so much power, it's, it's really fun. So this is, this right here, this little add upstream, is sort of a lesser known Git thing where you can, it's like a shortcut for the upstream branch of whatever this is. So like in this case, master is your master branch on your computer or on your, in your local repository. Um, and at upstream tells it, oh no, I'm actually looking at the master branch in the uh, remote repository. It's a little, it's a little shortcut. It's really cool. And you can actually make it shorter by, s like, you don't even have to type the whole word upstream. You can just type U. And you can even make it shorter than that. I forgot to put this on the slide, but you can, like, remove this completely and it'll use whatever your current branch is. So you can do, like, git show at curly brace U curly brace and it'll give you, you know, your, the upstream of your current, whatever your current branch is. It's really cool. It's handy. I use it all the time. And it, when I say I use it all the time, what I mean is I do this a lot. It's case sensitive. <laughs> it has to be a lowercase u, um, or it had to be lowercase u. So what I would do constantly is curly brace, which I have, I have to hold on shift, right, for the curly brace, and then u, and I wouldn't take my pinky finger off the shift key fast enough so the U would be capital, and then I would be annoyed, so I would uh, backspace twice, even though I only needed to do it once, and then again, curly brace very carefully, lowercase u, curly brace. This is an expert interface. <laughs> this, is, this is an interface that's, that's built for Utopia. You can't make mistakes when you're using uh, the git command line. This is, this is a, an interface for Utopia. need to read my notes for this slide. You guys know where I'm going. So like a year ago, almost, almost exactly a year ago, um, Stack Overflow published a blog post that was called something like Helping a Million Developers Exit Vim. It's exiting Vim is like a sysadmin rite of passage, or like a Linux user rite of passage. You're gonna get you're gonna get thrown into Vim at some point because it's the default on so many systems. You're gonna need to edit some file. You're gonna end up in Vim, and you start typing, and like, <laughs> like you don't see any of your keystrokes until like you get an empty line for some reason, and then all of a sudden something from up here copies down here. There's no close button. There's no exit command. Nothing in the interface helps you. At all, so you you know you type you start typing and goodness knows what happens. So you're like, all right, I gotta get out of here. I don't know what I'm doing, and you can't get out. Vim is built for Utopia. Vim is built for people who already know how to use it. So this, I mean, it's really pushing you to Stack Overflow. How do I get out of this text editor? I don't even know what the text editor is, but I can't exit. It's a Utopian interface. Um, it's designed for experts. And like I said before, it's not. I keep looking, I keep doing user interfaces, physical objects, and now software. It's not just user interfaces um, that are built for Utopia. Who? Anybody recognize this model? A couple people. Okay. So this is a visual model of what's called the waterfall model for software development. This is a waterfall process. This. This came from manufacturing in the, I don't know, 60s and 70s, in the US at least. And it's designed to reduce limit change. Because if you're designing a crock pot, you can't like, you know, do all the whatever and, and build the crock pot and then start shipping the crock pot to customers and then realize that you need to make it two inches wider and ship an update. Like you can't do that with a crock pot. It's a physical object. You gotta have this stuff nailed down. The cost of change at late stages is prohibitive when you're manufacturing physical objects. So this is a great system if you're manufacturing a physical object that is very expensive to change. So here, here's what here's how this works. Unfamiliar. 
um, require in the requirements page, each, each box here is a phase of software development. You don't go to the next phase until you're done with the phase that you're in. So requirements, you're working with your stakeholders, you're working with your customers, you're nailing down, okay, what is the software going to do? What's it going to do? What are my functional requirements? What are my performance requirements? What are my security requirements? You know, what, what, what does this need to do? What does this need to look like? This, this stage uh, can take months, years, <laughs> takes forever. And it, you end up with a requirements document or several requirements documents, depending. Once you have your requirements document, you end up in the design phase. So this is where you're deciding how you're going to build a system that meets these requirements. Um, you're doing a lot of high-level software architecture. And out of this phase, you get usually a design document and maybe an implementation plan. Um, I, wor I worked for one, one of my bosses once a long time ago said that in his ideal world, an implementation plan was so detailed that any software engineer, whether they were on the product, working on that project or not, whether they were working in that language or not, could pick up an implementation plan and write the software to meet the design, or to the design to meet the requirements without any other external knowledge. So that's the level of detail we're talking about. Um, so you finish the design process, and again, that can take months or years. And then you move into implementation. This is where you're actually writing software. Um, and you're writing it to the design document, which is designed to fulfill the requirements. You, you may already see some problems here, because you know it's not like when you're writing software, you ever find things that have to change in the requirements of the design. But we'll, we'll, go, we'll get to that. Um, when you're done with the implementation, you have working software. Huzzah! At that point. So the product is, is done. Like, it's essentially ready to ship. Now you go to verification, where you, your customer sees it for the first time, your stakeholders see it for the first time. Um, and they get to decide whether it's actually meeting the requirements that you said it would meet. And that's, that's the first time anybody finds out if those were the correct requirements at the end of the process. It's great. Um, and then you end up in maintenance where you know, the customer has accepted the product and you're just keeping it alive at this point. Software development. All right. I've been developing software. What year is it? 20, 2018. I've been developing software for almost 20 years. This is not how software development has ever worked for me, ever. In any company I've been in, not a single time has software development worked this way. You always need changes. Um, <laughs> neither the developers nor the clients and the customers and the stakeholders have enough information at the requirements phase to completely spec out everything that the system needs to do. You do not have enough information at that point. In the design phase, you cannot handle emergent properties of your software when you're just doing stuff at a high level and you're not actually building anything. You don't know how this stuff is going to fit together until you build it. So this is a, this is a great process for reducing change, reducing the impact of change. But with software, you know you're going to need change. And then software change isn't that hard. You're not building a crockpot. You're, building, you're writing code, and you can change the code. So this is kind of optimizing for a problem that is much less of a problem in software. It's When this is applied to software, it's software development for a utopia. It's software development for teams that do know all the information up front, who can deal with emergent properties that they don't know exist in the design phase, um, who know that they're building the right thing, not just building the, r the thing right, so that when they give it to their customers, their customers say, yep, this is perfect. This is, this is a software model for Utopia, for perfect teams, projects, companies. That's what this is. So that was a that was a system that was a that was a process that involves people building building things. Actually, writing code is also easy to fall into this. Let's build software for Utopia. Let's have expectations of of people that assume that they're perfect. Um, 
Several years ago, I worked for a company that had no automated tests at all. They had no tests. They, like, they didn't have unit tests at all. All of the testing was by the QA department. And the QA department was pretty solid. Like, they were, they was big and they, they did really good work. But there were no automated tests at all. And this was when, like, automated testing and TDD, like, all this stuff, it was very edgy. It was kind of like, oh, those, you know, those elites in Silicon Valley are doing that. But in upstate New York, <laughs> that's not how stuff works here. We do things differently. And I did some research. I, I read a bunch of papers. Um, there's a really famous Microsoft IBM collaboration that uh, talked a lot about how unit testing and TDD can improve the quality of your software. It's really interesting. Um, I did all this research, and I was like, this, this practice seems to actually work. This seems to actually increase code quality, reduce defects. Maybe we should. Maybe we should look at incorporating this into the software we're writing. And this was, you know, this was around like 2007, 2008. And I still remember the look of confusion on the head of my department's face when I when I was telling him about this. And he said, "But Gemma, you don't, you don't need to write tests. Just write correct code. <laughs> Just write correct code, guys. Just write correct code." Never write, never write an if condition that's accidentally backwards, because I've never done that. Anybody else never done that? Yeah, okay. Never, never write a typo, never forget a semicolon, never forget a comma, never forget literally any of the, like, writing code itself is a utopian process. If there's a single character out of place, everything breaks. So let's not make that harder. <laughs> it's already hard enough. Never forget edge cases, never when you're refactoring. Just write, write correct code. And I hear, I often hear similar comments about um, code comments, and I know this is a very, this is a very divisive issue in software engineering. People who think that your code should be clear enough that you don't need comments. If you need comments in your code, your code is, is bad. Your code should be self-documenting. And on one hand, I, gr I agree that readability, sorry, readability is very important. We spend a lot more time reading code than writing it, absolutely. We should be able to read code, and it should be clear. But at the same time, <laughs> it takes a certain amount of hubris to assume that the code you're writing is so clear and so elegant that anyone of any experience level who might be reading your code later can understand it without comments, can, can see your intention without comments, can understand exactly what's happening and what the implications are without any comments. We're not, we're not perfect. We're not all going to get it. Even if your code is that clear and it is that elegant, you know what? Sometimes I'm just not that bright, and I'm just not going to get it. So would you throw in a couple of comments? Because I'm not perfect. So how do we, how do we stop doing this? How, how do we try to build software for people who fail, and people who are not perfect, and people who are not utopian? So using it yourself is a big part of this, um, eating your own dog food. I mentioned that the, the Git uh, upstream shortcut, and it was case sensitive, so I had to like backspace and do a capital U. That actually changed in version 2.13 of Git. Somebody, one of the, it was one of the Git developers, he decided that it was, it was, it was too annoying. It was too annoying, he was constantly typing a, ca an, a capital letter when he meant to type a lowercase letter. So he just made the system accept both. He made it case insensitive. He was scratching his own itch. He was using his software himself, and he found a user interface problem that assumed everybody was perfect, that assumed everybody would make, make no mistakes. And because he made mistakes, he improved the software to make it more tolerant of that particular fault. So that's, a, that's, a, that's one way to do it. Um, another way is to get really aggressive about feedback. One of the things, so if you're, if you're like the tech person in your family or in your circle of friends, I often find myself in that role. Um, and it's always, it's always amazing to me if, if somebody's having a problem and they say, hey, Gemma, can you fix my computer? And they, you know, they explain their problem. And in the course of explaining their problem, I realize that what the problem that they're having that they think they need me to fix is actually a symptom of a much larger problem that they're having 
that they don't even realize is a problem. They just think it's normal. They just think it's supposed to work this way. And it's really awkward and unpleasant and <laughs> not, not easy, not semantic, not ergonomic, none of that. It's just, that's just how the software works and they think it's normal. Get serious about feedback with your users and ask them to tell you about their experience of using your software. Ask them to tell you how it makes them feel. I know, I know we don't like to talk about feelings in tech because tech is all about science and math and it's all rational and logical. But when you're building software, using software makes you feel things if it's annoying. You feel angry, you feel frustrated. Or if it's really fun to use, you're like, wow, that was really easy, that's great, you feel happy. Get them to talk about their feelings, get them to like describe their workflow using your software, even if they don't think it's broken, even if they think there's no problem. There might be, and they might not realize it, and you can improve it for them. Call a professional for the love of Pete. There are experts. There are people who are trained in user interface design. Um, there are consultants who do this for a living. Call them and throw them at your software and be like, hey, tell us, tell us what we're doing wrong. Tell us where this is awkward, because the first thing, use it yourself, won't always work. <laughs> because sometimes you're not your ideal user. Or you're not your you know, lowest common denominator user, your most common user. So that's software. For the process side of things, it's a little trickier because it's all about how humans are working together um, as a team or even just on their own. It's all about communication. It's all about, you know, what steps do I do? So have retrospectives about your process and talk about your feelings, which, you know, is going to feel silly. But it'll be worthwhile because if everybody on your team is frustrated with a particular piece of the process, maybe that could be changed. Maybe, maybe that's not a good, maybe that piece of the process, even if it's, you know, mandated by, from on high or it's some sort of industry best practice, if everybody's frustrated by this piece, maybe that process doesn't work for you guys and you should, or you people, and you should, you know, try something else. Um, and on that note, if you've got a big enough team, a big enough organization, a, B, test your process changes. Like, have, have one group, and again, this is, this is tricky because we're dealing with people and people are different. But, you know, have one team try this process and have the B team try the same process but with a small modification and see, compare the retrospectives and see how people felt about that change. Um, see if it made things smoother in your, in your building experience. Notice when stuff gets left out of the process by accident, or when everybody seems to be adding the same thing to the process. This, these kind of organic changes can indicate that maybe this should be part of the process. If everybody's doing, if everybody's making the same change in the same place, maybe that's something that works and you should consider incorporating it. Any gamers? Any gamers in the audience? Any gamers at all? Video gamers? Yes. And I'm including people who play like Stardew Valley, not just Halo. Okay. Sometimes we want utopia. Building for utopia isn't always a bad thing. Um, so I play, I play a lot of video games. <laughs> I've always played a lot of video games. I come from kind of a video gaming family, much to my mother's dismay. I'm really sorry, Mom. Um, my favorite video games usually involve some sort of very hard cooperative activity. Like, there's a lot to be said for, you know, going up against other players and fighting them and, you know, the, the best one wins, yada, yada. But there's the rush I get <laughs> out of collaborating with five other players or 39 other players to do something really, really hard, really challenging, something that demands absolute perfection, something that we worked on for weeks, hours and hours and hours. The rush I get out of doing that is just, it's like nothing. It's like nothing else. It is so satisfying. And the game will, you know, give you rewards and be like, hey, good job, have some, this is a purple thing. You can enjoy it. I do it. I do it for the rush. I do it for that just incredible feeling of satisfaction. We, we achieved utopia. We did it. 
we were perfect and it was hard and we were perfect. Oh, it's, it's a great feeling. If you guys aren't gamers, you should check it out because it's, it's a good time. Um, most, for most of us here, we're not building that kind of system in our day job. <laughs> we're not building a system that's gonna, that should demand excellence of its users. Our users, most of the time, aren't trying to get better at using our software. They're trying to solve a problem, and they're using our software as a tool to solve the problem. So don't demand that they use the tool perfectly, is all I'm saying. Um, they're not trying to get better at the tool. They don't care about the tool. They care about solving the problem. They care about you know, whatever goal they're trying to achieve that really has nothing to do with the software that you've written for them to help them do this goal. So build your stuff for the people who leave their stoves on overnight, like me, because really we're, we're all that person. And that's all I got. Um, there's, this is a panel of resources, stuff I talked about in the, in the talk, if you want to like take a picture with your phone to get the links or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thanks for coming. <laughs>